Welcome everyone, Costini here with my Marcus Wolfhard campaign guide for Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires. Marcus Wolfhard is both the best and the worst legendary lord of the Empire at the same time. He's the best in terms of the fact that he has the best campaign situation of all of them. He doesn't have to deal with Imperial Authority, he's not running around in the Thunderdome 2.0 trying to deal with Manfred, Sentra and others with a weak army as the Imperial one in the early game. He's the worst because of the hostility meter. Let's look at how Marcus works. Faction-wide effects, he gets minus 40 diplomatic relations with Lizardmen uh, and a plus 3 recruit rank for Huntsman General. So you can recruit these guys at rank 4, which is always nice uh, to have as you can then get uh, you can get a uh, Experience Hunter, Root Marcher, Inspiring Presence very early on. And once you do fight the battle, you can also get Survival Expert as well. And that is pretty beneficial uh, to have. Now, Huntsman Generals are pretty weak in terms of their combat potential, but their faction effects are certainly very nice uh, to have because getting that kind of range, uh, getting that kind of campaign movement range, getting that kind of replenishment rate, and just yeah, buffing archers and huntsmen is a pretty nice scouts. benefit. Marcus Wolfhart himself, he reduces upkeep by archers and huntsmen by 50%. Archers doesn't really matter as much, but huntsmen absolutely does because these are really the best range unit in the Empire arsenal. And he will maintain an upkeep of just 88 in his entire army for them. He gets recruit rank plus two. Uh, at rank 10, he gets missile resistance and melee defense. He gets campaign movement range, casualty or punishment. Further upkeep, missile strength and melee attack for those units. Double shot ammunition for huntsman units. Uh, telescopic aim and grand hunts marshal. He also has one item that has the amber bow ability with magical attacks and missile strength. Though, as a ranged lord, he won't necessarily do a significant amount of damage uh, in battle. Now, his main benefit in, a, in the campaign, and this is what makes him the best legendary lord of the empire, is the imperial supply system. So the way this works, every number of turns, dependent on the tier you're, you are with regards to uh, the, the, the empire, or rather your acclaim level, you will get imperial supply. So at the start of your campaign, it's four turns, and this go this will shorten the more uh, you are in terms of hostility. Basically, the way it works, the more battles you fight, the more your hostility meter goes up. The more battles you fight, the more your tier with the Empire goes up as well. So the better supplies and the faster you're going to get them as well. Now, the thing about supplies is they have units of every kind from the Empire. So you can get things like Great Cannons at the first tier. Yeah, no joke, Renee Launchers and Great Cannons. At uh, the second tier, at Peril Guardians, uh, you start getting things like Hellstorm rocket batteries. That's how powerful this system is. You are going to get a lot of units very, very quickly in this campaign that are going to be very powerful. And you're also going to get, uh, y and you're also not going to run out of money in this particular campaign very easily either, because you'll be fighting a lot of foes. Now, the downside is that once you get to tier 5, what will happen is that a full Lizardman Doomstack will spawn that you will have to deal with in your campaign. Now that is genuinely annoying, but you will get so many good troops that you should be able uh, to handle it. In terms of your starting position, you start a war with a minor Skaven faction of Clan Mange. And they basically start with two settlements, the monument over here and the provincial capital here in the Creeping Jungle. You also have the Savage Orcs over here of the Blue Vipers, which are just target practice for your archers, your huntsmen, and your artillery once you get it. They do occupy four settlements, but they're very easy to deal with. You do also have uh, the Dark Elves of the Blood Hall Coven, and then, of course, Rakarf over here, but they're not necessarily an enemy from the very start. How would I play this campaign? Well, you could decide to put to put in some effort over here to the south. Like basically, what you would do is you take the monument, recruit some archers for Marcus, and then get the second lord, 
And with that second lord, like once you finish taking over this province and moving on over here to take the swamps, with that second lord, keep uh, locally recruiting and globally recruiting archers and crossbowmen, and of course using an imperial supply system. While your main army marches over here to deal with the blue vipers. What I would do, so, so basically Marcus is main army, he's gonna move over here in this pattern. Come over here, take the high sentinel, and this is the kind of mod where, uh, this is the kind of uh, campaign writer, sorry, that you could really benefit from the public order penalty removal mod. Because you're gonna deal with a lot of public order penalty, especially when you're at the condemned level. It is annoying. Now, it's not really so much of an issue, more so than an annoyance, and I would rather uh, personally deal with that, but regardless of what you choose with respect to that. Then. Um, you want to come over here, and you want to take this element, uh, deal a blow to the Savage Orcs, and I would also, wanna, when you're moving on from the settlement and you're moving into the next region over here in the Shrine, I would sell it to the New World Colonies. Though I would not make any non-aggression pact or trade agreement or military access with these guys, just sell them uh, these two territories, then come over here to deal with Mazda Mundi. Now, dealing with Mazda Mundi is not going to be an easy fight, but by this point you should be able to get some good Imperial supplies, get Hellstorms, get other good things as well, get more Huntsmen, great swords, etc. And you might also have to deal with uh, do uh, Doomstack, so to speak, That's of Lizardmen coming for your core territory. It is possible to defeat that Doomstack with your secondary army instead of having to march Marcus, because generally that Doomstack will spawn somewhere around here. And your second ar army you should take this settlement in particular and sell it to Alberic. You should make an alliance with him as quickly as possible. Either way, you come over here, you should get some Imperial supplies to throw in this army. Though you might want to throw some Imperial supply units in this secondary in a secondary army as well. Come over here, deal with Mazda Mundi. Um, try and make some kind of deal with Morafi. Take territory here, uh, deal with Skeggy, and then go deal with the New World Colonies. If someone else hasn't already dealt with them. You might also want to get the third army at this point, filled with archers, to also help with that. And, and this is going to be a slow process, but Mazda Mundi can become really powerful, but he's got a lot on his plate from the beginning. That's the reason you kind of want to rush him very, very early on. Once you deal with him, you can't confederate the New World Colonies. If you could, that would be a much easier situation. They're, that's because they're a stallion, basically, and uh, they're supposed to be their own race, or run their own faction, if you will as opposed to being an Imperial. So you can't confederate them, so you are going to have to declare war on them and take them out. Likely same thing with Ogres. I'd probably deal with Skeggy first, then Ogres, then deal with Port Reaver, and then deal with everything else around here. And just eventually end up with Marcus back here. At this point, you may want to deal with the Blood Hole Coven and Rakarf while you let Albrecht secure your frontier. Keep in mind, however, that you do have these four heroes. They're, I wouldn't say they're legendary heroes, but they are pretty solid. Now, in order to gain these heroes, you need to do various objects like move, uh, be at war with the Vampire Coast uh, mutineers. Though that's not really going to be an issue because Luther, will wipe, Luther Harkon will wipe them out or move a character in this particular province. Basically, you're probably just going to want to recruit a hero that's just going to do that. Uh, you should be able, so you should be able to get... Uh, the Wood Elf one and um, um, the Witch Hunter pretty quickly in your campaign. It is going to be slower to get the Engineer and it's going to be slower to get the Bretonian Paladin. And then they'll have different objectives over here that you will need to complete. It is an annoying quest system, but you can certainly gain a decent amount of power with them. You might also have to deal with Morafi one way or another in this campaign. Though it might be in your interest to make a deal with her and just basically coexist. Now, one interesting situation in this campaign is is the following. You can't take over the Empire. That's the weird part, if you will. Like, so temperate climate is not suitable. That is a major downside. So if you want to come over here in the Empire and take it over, that is something of an issue. But what you can do... And this is where it gets interesting. You can take over Wolf One. While it seems like an insane plan, keep in mind that while you're going to be dealing with constant bloody attacks by the Lizardmen, and I wonder if there's a mod to just prevent that after a while. Like, 
like let's say you would reach uh, like let's say the lizardman factions get wiped out i'm not sure if this is the case but let's say the lizardman factions and lustra get wiped out or some of these factions get wiped out you no longer have to deal with the annoyance of the damn lizardman spawning constantly or you know you you would just have the meter reset once you get to level five um <clears throat> but you can take hold one and you should be able to have the armies to deal with them because you can get really really good units and again, you won't run out of money. Like, this is the kind of campaign where being hyper-aggressive really pays off in a major way. Because you can outrun your opponents. And by getting such high-tier units, and you just need to find battles. Like, this is the campaign where you find battles, you get better units, you find more battles with those better units, you get even more units, and on and on and on it goes. The downside is you're probably going to have to maintain an army on the defensive. I, uh, w when we're looking at victory conditions... You do need to eliminate some of these factions. But I wouldn't be too worried about Clan Pestilent or Lufer Harkon. I would be worried about Gorok, but you probably want to wait until Gorok has eliminated uh, that. And you do need to gain control over all of Lustra, which is certainly a significant endeavor. Once you're done with that, you may want to head over to Wolfon and conquer it, and then go for the Empire. What's going to be left of it anyway by that point, if uh, you so desire. Uh, in terms of an endgame crisis, sure, you could, I would probably, if you want to enable an endgame crisis, you could probably enable a Skaven one, though at a weaker level. Um, I say at the weaker level, just so Skrull doesn't end up dominating all of Lustria if you're not careful about it. Um, and your best ally, and probably your only ally, is going to be Alberic in this campaign. But it certainly can be a powerful campaign, though it's also a campaign with a great deal of annoyances in it. Quasi in signing out, don't forget to subscribe, like, enable notifications, stay tuned for more.